Stacy came down, getting communion ready and the front ready, and uh, she had Sophia with her. And Stacy said, I understand that you are bringing the message today. I said, yes. And I looked at Sophia and I said, I'm going to talk about love. And she said, I'm staying. <laughs> So since he's staying, all of you adults have to stay. <laughs> There's no get out of jail free card here. <laughs> Let us begin in prayer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O God, o God my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Well, these days, I am surrounded by wedding talk. Surrounded. But let's see if you agree. Our youngest daughter, Debbie, is planning to be married this coming September to Zach Freeland. He is truly a wonderful fellow. And um, Carol and I feel so blessed that he is joining our large and growing family. And so as father of the bride, you know exactly what I mean when I tell you that there is some very serious wedding planning going on. <laughs> and we're talking serious. At our worship service here two weeks ago, Elder Vi preached on the wedding at Cana. And there Jesus performed his first miracle in the Gospel of John by turning wash water, of all things, into the finest wine for the wedding guests. This was clearly an emergency situation, as Vi told us, as the quantity of wine that had been provided had already been unexpectedly consumed. Immediately after that service, Carol and I got in our car and headed to Dallas to be with Debbie and the caterer that we're using. And uh, during our time of tasting brisket and little hors d'oeuvres and two different kinds of meatballs, I didn't really know there were two different kinds, <laughs> and cake, I just kept thinking, what am I going to do if we run out unexpectedly of food for our guests? This weekend, Pastor Lee is away officiating at the wedding of Nancy and Richard Tolman's son, Eli. And so Eli's wedding is why I am standing here in this place. And now, this week's lectionary readings include the text from 1 Corinthians 13, which is commonly referred to as the love chapter. I think he mentioned that. And it conjures up images of white dresses, tuxedos, unity candles, cute little flower girls, and handsome ring bearers. So I hope that you can now understand why I feel surrounded by wedding talk. Well, I give in. I give in. Today we will speak about love so I can fulfill the promise to Sophia. And this is a type of love that the Apostle Paul addresses in 1 Corinthians. Well, we're also going to talk about what that love means to us as believers, and perhaps just as important, what it asks of us here at New Covenant Fellowship. And in honor of those wonderful words at the end of chapter 13, I'm going to have Carol light a candle for me. Um, this is in a little candle holder that sits on my desk. And you might not be able to see it from where you sit, which is why preachers always say something like that, so you might come and sit down in one of these open spaces. It says faith on one side, love, hope, and joy. And so it's a constant reminder to me of the 1 Corinthians 13 text. Well, how many of you thought of a special wedding, or weddings in general? 
when we read that First Corinthians text a few minutes ago. It's really no surprise, as both the spiritual and secular weddings have essentially taken over this text. But when Paul wrote it, weddings were probably nowhere on his mind. Scripture needs to be understood in context. And by that I mean we best hear the Holy Spirit interpreting Scripture when we understand what comes before and what comes after. It helps to know what the background is, or perhaps even what the audience was when this letter was written. Well, Paul wrote this letter to the church in Corinth in response to a letter that they had sent to him. So this is a return letter. And they had told him of all the major problems going on in this church in Corinth. He had founded that church perhaps three years before. And Jesus had been crucified, died, and buried, and risen about 17 years earlier in this letter. The churches that Paul had started were very young. Very young. Younger than this church. And so, some of the same temp tensions that are operating full blast in a lot of other churches were operating there as well. And so this letter addressed problems and issues that Paul wanted these first Corinthians who were receiving this letter to first understand very clearly and then to correct. The Corinthian church generally valued personal wealth and at the same time abused the poor in its midst. The love that exhibited among members was at best superficial. I imagine that there were very few Jacob Lou love shakes going on there. The culture of the day valued people who achieved honor while shaming others less fortunate. The culture praised the high and the mighty, and at the same time made sure that blame was placed wherever it could. Church members argued about which spiritual gifts were the most important, and they argued over who had them and who did not. The Corinthian church refused to share sufficiently among its members. The members boasted of their own spiritual gifts while scorning the spiritual gifts of others. The members jockeyed for power in the church. Does this sound familiar about any church that you belong to in your years? So Paul uses chapter 12, the chapter before this, to remind the Corinthians that the body of Christ, the church, is made up of many members with all kinds of gifts, just like the parts of our earthly bodies. Paul explained that each member of the church body needed the others. Members cannot disrespect other members or belittle them or create dissension among the body, Paul taught. So he ends chapter 12 with these words. And I will show you a still more excellent way. And that leads us to our love chapter. So the type of love being talked about with Paul is not romantic or erotic love, the kind of thing that you might see in a Hollywood movie. And it's not the same type of love that I mean when I say, you know, I really love Amy's Mexican vanilla with chocolate covered with strawberries, topped with Cool Whip. But I'm getting off topic here. It's not that kind of love. The Greeks had better language than we do today to differentiate the types of love that could exist, and Paul is referring to what is called agape love. You may have heard that Greek word. It's not defined by how we love ourselves, but how we can love for the benefit of the one who is loved. It's not a love that's contingent on getting its own way. In fact, it's just the opposite. It's a selfless love. It's a type of love shown in the story in Luke 
chapter 15 about a person from Samaria. Samaritans are despised by the Jews. This Samaritan stopped to help a stranger who had been badly injured on the highway. The Samaritan cared for this man in a selfless way, ensuring that care and shelter would be given and paid for without asking for repayment. But before the Samaritan showed up, a Jewish priest and a Levite who was descended from one of the 12 tribes of Israel, the tribe of Levi, also saw the man on the road. But you know, they couldn't be bothered. And they went to the other side. The Samaritan, however, exhibited agape love to the suffering man. And this same agape love is what God has shown us through the life, death, and resurrection of God's Son, Jesus Christ. This is the type of love that Paul is imploring the Corinthians to exhibit to each other daily in their community. But Paul went further. He describes, and Scott read it, we read it, the three most important characteristics of the Christian life. First, Paul says, is faith. This does not mean the type of faith that I might have in Peyton Manning next Sunday, leading a last-minute Super Bowl-winning touchdown drive. No, it's not that kind of thing. No, the faith here in Corinth means the trust that we direct toward the God of Israel, that all the covenant promises of new life in Christ will be fulfilled in all believers. Next, Paul says, is hope. This does not mean the type of hope that I might have, that Cam Newton will win his first Super Bowl trophy next Sunday. No, no. This hope here in Corinth by Paul means that we focus our greatest desire that God will restore this totally broken world to complete wholeness when Christ comes again. That's what hope is. And then Paul mentions love. This goes beyond the romantic love that wraps around the bride and groom at a wedding and points to the ultimate union that we have with the God that created us and loved us perfectly through giving us his son to die for our sins. And we're going to celebrate that here at this table just a few minutes. Faith will not be needed in the future because in the future we will no longer see through a mirror dimly. But we will see God face to face. We will have no more need of faith. And hope, hope will not be needed in the future because hope we will see the one for whom we yearn. It will be real. We won't have to hope for it. But love, love stands out. Love is eternal. Love is the one thing, the only thing, that connects us here with the world to come. The love chapter ends with now, faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Now in the gospel text that we read together from Luke, we find Jesus being nearly pushed off the edge of the mountain by enraged religious people. Were they exhibiting to Jesus the kind of love we're talking about here? No way. No way. They were angry because Jesus was essentially saying that God loves all people, capital A, capital L, L, and that God works wondrous things through all kinds of people, not just people of Israel. 
The message of Jesus is that God is the God of all people. God loves all. Jesus brings this message of restoration, renewal, and restitution. Those would be three good R's for Pastor James. I Pastor for all who are poor and oppressed and captive. And to me, there is a significant message here for our nation, for our current leaders, and for all who wish to be our future leaders. That's just going to have to be another sermon. So what might this message of love mean to us here at New Covenant Fellowship? What gifts do each of you have to share with everyone else? And how are you each loving one another as church members or loving the world beyond those doors back there? When you know that there's a member who needs a weekly ride to church, have you offered one? Have you offered one? How have you responded in service to what made God's personal call be to you? Just like Nikki was teaching our beautiful little one. Two weeks ago, we installed new leadership. Two ruling elders, one deacon. And at the same time, we thanked 10 people, 10 officers whose terms were finished. I don't know whether you were here or not. We certainly want them to know that this doesn't end their leadership or commitment here. Their love of you and their personal leadership and their faith leadership is always going to be needed. And as you remember, Pastor James was sitting right here. And he said, if anyone dances down this aisle about your officer term ending, I will trip you. <laughs> he says, if I'm this, I will get you on the way back. So God's call of Jeremiah was read as this first piece of scripture today that Scott did so nicely as Nikki planned to the children to hear the, those great words from Jeremiah of boy. We heard God calling Jeremiah to speak God's word to God's people at a very, very difficult time. And Jeremiah used a great excuse. I just wish I wasn't so old that I could not use it also right now. Remember, God was not having any of it. And as soon as Jeremiah said it, God said, Do not say, I am only a boy. For you shall go to all whom I send you. And you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. So, the next time that you are asked to contribute your energy, your love, and yourselves to the work of the church, I encourage you to not respond as Jeremiah, but say yes! Because you know that the words and the energy that you need will be given to you. And in fact, I don't really know it, but you've already all been drafted. Did you know that? Did you know that? Did you notice who's in charge of congregational life here at New Covenant? Does anybody have a bulletin? All right, I want you to look at your bulletins. It's on the back. On the back, center. Right below the list of ruling elder assignments and above the list of deacons, there's the Congregational Life Committee here at 2016. What's that read? Oh. All members and friends. All members and friends. And so we have a very wise session, and they've just drafted all of us to be the Congregational Life Committee. And what that is, is that we are responsible to each other to celebrate our life together, to care for each other at events, Easter and Advent and birthdays and Thanksgiving and beyond. All members and friends are responsible for loving each other. And so I thank you for volunteering. 
And you have a chance to do it really soon because there should be sign-up sheets in the back for helping to make Pastor James's birthday celebration on the 13th of February a wonderful time. So please feel free to sign up and help make that happen since you're a committee member. The love of God that Paul encourages us to learn how to share is really hard to do. It's hard to do it. It sounds so perfect in Scripture. But you need to trust that you'll be given the strengths and the words to do it by the Holy Spirit. And so I'm going to end with a story. Two weeks ago, as a chaplain at Hospice Austin, I was called out at 1 a.m. to the family of a grandmother. And when I arrived, our nurse had already pronounced her death. And the family had gathered in that room and wanted a chaplain to say a prayer. Well, I had never met the family before. I knew nothing of her story. But I wanted this sacred time to be meaningful for all who had gathered there. So, I asked someone to tell me her story, to describe her to me. I really wanted them to describe her to each other also. So finally, someone started to tell her story, not just her titles of mother, sister, grandmother, aunt, hard worker, cook, quilter. I knew they would come, but I wanted to know a little more. I wanted to know who she was as a person. And so those stories came too. I heard that she was loving with high expectations for children and grandchildren to love God and to love one another and to behave properly, or you'd know what was going to happen. So the stories began to flow, as did the laughter and the tears. And some, I remember when, type stories. So when they were done, I summarized those back to them, using scripture, and tying it to the promises of the faith that were made to her at her baptism many decades ago. And so before we prayed, I asked what should we pray for? And after moments of silence, her brother spoke. He said, we should pray that the rest of the family continue to love each other as she loved them, each of them, to stick together and to watch out for each other, to care for each other beyond any tension that always comes. He was really telling them that the only thing that lasts forever is the love that is given away. His words that night, given to him by the Holy Spirit, were a priceless gift to those gathered children and grandchildren. And here today, I pass that gift on to you. And now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, and the greatest of these, is love. Let us pray. Amen. And now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen.